on this large screen, you have a, um, if you have your first Manchu, namely a, a Manchu, Gizun. Gizun is the tongue, so it's the language, lingua in Latin. Um, it's um, a, a term that uh, you can see here on the right, and that's your first lesson, the first um, part of the lesson. Uh, you read Manchu in columns going from left to right. You read Chinese in columns going from right to left. That means that if you have documents that are in two languages, uh, they meet in the middle. So Manchu flowing from the left, to left end of the scroll, Chinese from the right hand. And then in the middle, you often have a big seal or a, um, um, a picture or signatures, anything that makes the document uh, an official document. Um, so that was your first lesson. The um, Manchu language, which is written in columns and uses a script, which to some of you may look familiar, more or less, um, well, I, I'm going to say something about this in, in a moment. Um, on the right-hand side, you have a Chinese term, which uh, is often used in the Qing period in order to express that a text is in Manchu. It means uh, the Qing language, Qinghua, sometimes Qing Yu, and um, the, um, the term literally translated means the language of the Qing. Of course, um, uh, that's very much the point that I'm going to make now. The Qing had more than one language. The Qing had uh, uh, at least, in the end, five official languages. Um, but but um, probably a yeah, hundred if you take all the minority languages into account as well. And uh, so if you speak of the Qing language, it means the language of the, the Qing dynasty. And um, that is the point that where we'll be arriving in a second. So where do the Manchus come from? Manchus come from a, an area um, which is dominated by plains. And these plains and mountains are delineated to the, to the top by the sky. And this is where the Mongols, the Manchus, and other Tungusic uh, families, uh, Tungusic uh, members of the family, uh, get their veneration for space and especially for the space above, for, um, for, for, for the um, uh, uh, endless sky that uh, must have seemed like the ultimate deity, ultimate god in, um, uh, in pre-modern China. And therefore you have the so-called Tengri cult, which um, uh, goes back also in Chinese history to um, uh, beginnings which uh, take you uh, into the realm of uh, shamanism. And shamanism, of course, you have uh, in a variety of forms. And you get this, for instance, in the classical shaman art that is depicted here at the early, uh, at the beginning of the 19th, sorry, 20th century, um, in the Qing court. And um, uh, of course, um, this is not the main uh, Qing ritual, shamanic ritual, because we know that that was performed by a woman. So um, the main shaman in the Qing court is a woman. Uh, uh, shamans in uh, ordinary Tungusic practice are men. And um, you find the, exactly the same in the, those parts of the um, Tungusic world, which um, have the same connection to uh, th the sky. And um, therefore, you also have them in Lapland, for example, or in other parts of Siberia. It's, uh, and of course, in Mongolia. But um, uh, th this is something which became more or less a hallmark of Manchu civilization. Qing religion is much more than just one thing. And certainly, uh, the shamanic element is very much in the background. It's almost a private cult. And here you can see the, um, the pole, which um, is 
the connection between the earth and the sky. So in other words, this is the, um, the original Manchu element in the court ritual of the uh, Chinese empress, the imperial dynasty in uh, Shenyang. And in Shenyang, of course, you have uh, the second capital of the Qing, uh, the Qing dynasty itself. For those of you who want to place it in, um, in historical terms, begins in the 1630s. 1644 is the date of the conquest of Beijing. That's when the uh, Qing imposed themselves onto the Ming dynasty. And from that point onwards, you also have Beijing as the capital. Beijing is the, the political capital. You can say um, uh, Shenyang up in the north is the dynastic capital, and both would remain in parallel function until the end of the dynasty in 1911. So um, 1630, 1631 to all the way until 1911, that is the stretch that you could identify as the, um, the, the, the Qing uh, era. Now, uh, if you look here on the right, you can see the, uh, the Tangse. Tangse is, a, a, um, a, is an almost um, private affair. Um, I say almost because it's dynastic. And in the uh, families, in the uh, more, um, in the wealthier families, in the larger families, it also becomes uh, an ancestral duty. So in other words, there is a certain parallel to the Chinese uh, ancestral rituals, but um, uh, importantly, um, the connection with the sky worship is there, because if you look at the tablets, these are clearly emulations of the um, uh, of the pole that you see here. So there is a you can say this is the family uh, shamanic um, altar that um, every larger, um, every more important uh, Qing family uh, had to have, and this is the one that you can find in Shenyang, in the uh, imperial palace. Tangzhe, Tangzhe is is um, just here the. Uh, Chinese is the um, is the transcription of the of the Manchu, uh, so th this is not the other way around. So the, uh, it it sounds very much like um, you know this is a hall, <laughs> but that's not the case. So just a short uh, glance at the way that Shenyang was conceived, you can see here uh, that you have a variety of uh, temples and sacred spaces. And then also political spaces, um, especially the um, uh, if you look at the um, headquarters on the on the right. <clears throat> yeah, you can see that this is the area where uh, Nurhaci established. So Nurhaci is the founder of the um, of the Qing. And he's also, he's much more, he's also the founder of the Manchus. And I'll say a few words about him in a, in a second. Um, uh, he made sure that all the um, uh, Manchu speaking, Tunguzic speaking, Jurchen speaking uh, groups within his uh, um, new state, that they were directed towards him. So here on the left and right, you have the offices that belong to each of the banners and the banners, um, Known as uh, um, uh, they're known as qi uh, in Chinese, so they're flags more or less. Um, uh, the niru, you have a, a concept which goes back to the development of the um, uh, of uh, the Mongolian society during the uh, times of Genghis Khan, when Mongolia, the Mongolian tribes, Mongolian nations, if you like were being subdivided into banners. And these banners had one particular function, namely to express loyalty to the ruler, to the Khan. And the term Khan, Khagan, is something that you get uh, from the Mongolian experience. And the Manchus took this over. Nurhaci took this over. He became Khan over the, um, uh, the new empire, the new state. It's this area where you find this word, the Tunguzi tribes, where you actually have to look for the ancestors of the um, uh, of, of the um, the Manchus, because it's the Ebeks, the Ebenks, 
and uh, uh, other uh, smaller groups uh, who are directly uh, linked to the Jurchen. The Jurchen begin a migration process southwards. I mean, this is the Jin Empire, the, the, Jin, the, the Jin state, but as um, an ethnic group, you would find them here between Sakhalin, Sakhalian Alin, so the Black Mountain. So this is the, um, th this is not the Manchu speaking part, this white strip here, this is um, a, a, um, an extension of the, the, the Japanese islands and of course also the Russian, uh, now under Russian control. Um, uh, Sakhalin would have been a hard border. So this is uh, where you don't find Manchus, but Manchu speakers, Jurchen speakers, uh, you find in all of this territory and northwards. So uh, you can say the Tungusic tribes and the uh, Jurchens of the Jin, they would have been able to communicate. Here we find an early map of the, um, uh, of the Tungusic area. So if we just go back one, uh, so where you find here the Tungusic tribes, this is the Eastern end of what becomes the far east of the uh, Russian empire. And it's uh, the Russian Tsars who had a particular interest in finding out more about the Tungusic peoples. And this, um, for this purpose, they <clears throat> send, they pay um, uh, members from all over Europe to travel to the east, not just Europeans, actually also Tartars. Tartars are a Turkic um, uh, group who, um, are more or less in the um, in the service of the um, uh, of the Tsar, and they are usually involved in military uh, campaigns. But the scientific campaigns they are uh, spearheaded by uh, by Europeans, and that includes, of course, the Russians, the Moscovite Russians. So, <clears throat> early seventeenth century, we have um, an excursion into the land of the Tunguzik, Tunguzland. So this is um, uh, the eastern. Um, no, northeastern parts of, uh, uh, of Siberia, um, roughly around the same time as the term Manchu is being coined further south. This map makes it a little bit easier to distinguish between the different uh, Tunguzic groups. Um, so you have the northern Tunguzic, who then extend uh, across the Urals into, um, into Scandinavia, so in other words, this is the, um, uh, this is the uh, family of languages which still exist within the Russian Federation, uh, but th they have a clear minority status. So you can imagine that these areas are very sparsely inhabited. And because of the, the fact that, uh, that they are um, uh, almost um, uh, uninhabited, so they, they are, uh, often nomadic, so in many uh, cases when the winters are very severe, uh, much of this is actually not inhabited at all. And um, in later centuries, um, you would have had cities that were created by Russia in order to um, uh, exploit the uh, natural resources that existed in these places. That could be wood, that could be um, that, that, that could be uh, furs, and then later, of course, um, mineral resources, uh, including oil. But it's this group that we're interested in. Uh, on the, along the Amur, yes, well, it was today the Primorsky Krai, the, um, the easternmost uh, province of, uh, of Russia, uh, opposite Japan. Um, but it's this group that is of interest to us. And you, uh, Southwestern Tunguzi, you can already see that um, this is not at all a territorial nation uh, which covers the, the whole of Manchuria. Um, in fact, you have uh, in the eastern part, especially up to Suping. Suping has the, uh, here in the center of uh, Jilin province, um, th that is more or less the boundary. To the west of that, it's the Mongolian um, uh, populations that dominate. To the east, the Jurchen and other migrant groups, and that includes the Chinese. It also includes the Koreans. This is uh, from a, um, a, a book that you uh, can find at SOAS as well. So this is a, um, um, 
a book on the tributary nations, but also on all the minority populations of the Qing, all the uh, known populations in Asia and, um, and beyond. And beyond, that means uh, usually Europe. Not all of Europe, but those uh, parts of Europe that sent um, traders. And uh, the, the Russians, Oros, Gurun, Nyalma, Nyalma, Nyalma is people, uh, Gurun is country, Oros is the name for Russia. And this is uh, in case you're wondering where the term Oros comes from in Chinese, it's a Manchu word. So it's the Manchu term for, for Russia. Uh, so, Alban uh, uh, So this is, um, uh, th this is, uh, uh, in a somewhat simplified form in Chinese, uh, referred to as the um, uh, the, the uh, illustrated um, a book of tributary peoples to the uh, Great Qing country. So it's the, the Great Qing, Dai Qing Gurun, is of course a term that is being formed precisely then. So I'm going to give you a map version of this. Um, and a very brief explanation of how we get to the Qing in the first place, namely that is connected to the person uh, of, um, uh, uh, to, to a, a single um, uh, person who uh, actually created the term uh, Manchu. And um, uh, if you, um, uh, uh, if you've ever heard of Nurhachi or Nurgachi, as it can also be pronounced, um, then it, you usually get the impression that this is a um, Manchu nationalist who tries to break free from the oppression of the Ming. Uh, but there are a few caveats. Um, he is, first of all, Nurhachi is, first of all, a, um, an official who's in the service of the Ming dynasty. He's, in his active in um, uh, Shenyang, Shenjing, in the, illustrated here on this map. And um, this is very important because he actually learns how the Ming dynasty operates. Um, why is this important? Because it shows that the Manchus from the very beginning, the Qing dynasty from the very beginning, the Manchus themselves as the people from the very beginning were heavily influenced in civilizational terms by China. So in other words, these are no longer the Tunguzic peoples who come from the north, here, Heilongjiang and northwards, <clears throat> uh, and establish themselves as complete outsiders. Th this is a myth which is being built up in the late 19th century as a justification for um, uh, essentially getting rid of the Chinese, sorry, of the, of the Manchus, of the Qing, I was going to say, as aliens, as Manchus, as uh, people who are not part of Chinese civilization. This is not true. From the very beginning, uh, uh, the, the Manchus are part of the Chinese enterprise, civilizational enterprise, because they share very important features of Chinese civilization. And also, you can see that the northern populations of the Manchus and the southern have developed uh, here in the Jianzhou area, they've developed apart. They have developed uh, importantly into two different um, anthropological types. One that is matriarchal in the north, one that is patriarchal in the south. So you have ancestral lines that focus on the male ancestor in uh, amongst the Jianzhou Manchus, and in the north where you have the, the wild Manchus, um, that was the term that was actually used at the time. <clears throat> it was the women who were in charge and the women who were also venerated within society and uh, also in a more religious sense. So um, there, there are uh, changes that occur during this process of um, becoming part of China, which, um, uh, which the Manchus don't escape. So what does Nurhachi do? Nurhachi does important things. For example, he takes over the Manchu script, um, sorry, the Mongolian script, um, in creating the very concept of uh, what it means to be Manchu, he acknowledges that the most important country that he relies on is Mongolia. 
is the, this great Mongolian enterprise that you can see here on the, on the right. And um, that's one explanation why so many words within Manchu are of Mongolian origin. In some tribal words, uh, in some tribal vocabularies, um, further uh, here on the uh, eastern side, the western side, sorry, um, of, of the, the, the Manchus, the eastern side of the Mon Mongolian uh, uh, civilizational outreach, um, up to half of the vocabulary is actually Mongolian. So um, <clears throat> uh, Nurhaci, in the quest to create a language for his new Manchu people, um, borrows directly from the Mongols because he knows that all Mongols all Manchus know how to read Mongolian. Very important. So where did the Mongolians get their script from? I'm going to show you some Manchu first. <clears throat> so uh, remember that it flows like this. I'm going to enlarge it a little bit so you can uh, you can look at the uh, look at the characters. And now imagine that you turn them. Um, 90 degrees on this on its side and then all of a sudden you don't have um uh, you don't have columns anymore but you have lines and these lines hmm, you can read from right to left so if you get this image of uh, a script that writes from runs from right to left and that is written with dots and with circles um you get very close to a language that is used at the western end of Asia, in the Arabian Peninsula, in northern Africa, namely Arabic. So how are Arabic and Manchu script, Mongolian script, related? Well, they are uh, both derivatives of an earlier language, of an earlier language, if you look at Syriac, Syri um, the Syriac script, you can see that you have uh, this as the vehicle for transliterating uh, uh, Aramaic, which is, of course, the spoken language at the time of Jesus. So um, from this, you get a writing system, which is being used in various forms, also by peoples in the Western parts of Asia. And one of the populations who borrow this are the Uyghurs, not the Uyghurs who we know today, but the Old Uyghur Kingdom, and then also the Second Uyghur Kingdom, and they use this script in order to um, uh, for their own Turkic language, which develops out of them. And it's only much later in the Islamification of uh, Xinjiang of Turkestan that you get um, a Arabic script which replaces this writing system. But one ethnic group that borrows from the Uyghurs at this early point are the Mongols. And the Mongols, very cleverly, they turn this um, on their side and they use um, uh, th this Syriac writing system in order to produce their, reproduce their own language from a uh, runic system that they had before. If you're interested, uh, I have, um, uh, I can point you in the direction of a certain um, linguistic, uh, historical linguistic um, articles in that direction. So this is the um, this is the origin of the writing system, and it's this writing system that Nurhaci takes over in the early 17th century, and he, in later years, there is one difference, namely the addition of dots and circles, which enables. Um, <clears throat> enables the speaker to uh, reproduce the sounds more um, uh, more accurately than in Mongolian. So in Mongolian, there's a lot of guesswork. Is it a ha? Is it a ka? Is it a, <laughs> is it a, a ga? <laughs> in, in Manchu, you know immediately, and you will be learning how, how this works with the, um, with the system that, is, um, uh, th that I'm going to introduce you to. Tuli Shen. Anyone who heard of Tulishen? Tulishen is a, uh, a, a Manchu official who travels for the Qin westwards. He travels through the western parts of, um, uh, of uh, uh, the Qin Empire, but he also travels into 
uh, surrounding kingdoms, also Russia. Um, he's, in other words, a, um, uh, a traveling emissary of the, of the Qing, and he writes a, um, a, a very uh, important um, work which um, gives us a very detailed impression of the populations that inhabit Central Asia and the West uh, at this stage. So this is um, a, a, a book that we have here at SOAS, for example, uh, by Zhuang Jifa, uh, translated into Chinese by Zhuang Jifa, but you get the original uh, Manchu writing system too. So at some point, we will be able to read this together and um, you, you will be able to, uh, to make sense of the, the Manchu writings um, rather soon. This is another version that we have here at SOAS. Um, so uh, in uh, English, I think, yes. Or maybe Japanese, no? Oh, yes, we, we, we will. Yes, you, you can definitely. Uh, uh, th this is, um, uh, is certainly uh, uh, also interesting because you get maps. And these maps, of course, uh, you have them for the northern parts of the team in, uh, uh, in Manchu. Um, uh, there's a map exercise a map creation exercise that is ongoing in uh, Leiden, and so as are directly involved with that. So um, this is something where you can ask me again for uh, help. So just just some words, and this I, I, I would like to um, uh, advance to um, the practical part of language learning in a moment. Um, but uh, we need to be clear about one thing, namely that the Manchus do not impose their culture onto, the, onto China. They integrate it into a, um, a fabric of different ethnic traditions that already exist during the Ming period, that already exists during the Tang period, that probably already exists during the Qin and the Han. So in other words, these are enormous, it's an enormous territorial empire that has many living ethnic traditions in it. And um, because of this, um, uh, because of the fact that these traditions ex exist side by side, um, there is an understanding that the most important, the numerically most important traditions uh, need to be able to govern the country together. And because of this, you have a rather complex system of coexistence that is being worked out um, legally and in terms of power sharing um, between the Manchus, the Mongols, the Tibetans, and the Chinese. These are the four big groups who, in the beginning, dominate. There's a fifth group that will be added in due course. I'm, I'm going to show that to you in a, in a moment. But here you can see uh, the the if first in um, um, Mongolian, then in Manchu, here on the right-hand side, in uh, Tibetan script, and in Chinese. Um, this is from the Falun um, Gong. This is, of course, it's a religious building. It's um, from the Yongha uh, Gong, the uh, Namai's temple, which is built by the uh, Yongzheng Emperor in Beijing. Um, why do the, um, uh, does uh, Tibetan um, Buddhism play such an important role? Tibetan Buddhism is the glue that keeps the, um, the, the non-Chinese parts of the Qing Empire together. So you have this northern belt. If I go back. Um, you have a northern belt, which you can uh, draw. You draw the border here from, from Korea all the way through Manchuria, Mongolia, and then also historically through Xinjiang and then Tibet. Uh, why historically? Because by the 15th century, so by, by the um, uh, mid-late um, Ming era, um, Xinjiang had predominantly converted to, um, to Islam. But um, there are still pockets even today which are Buddhist. But um, before they did so, they converted to um, Buddhism um, as it uh, was being practiced in Tibet. So Tibetan Buddhism 
has a very strong unifying, uh, culturally unifying uh, impact on the neighboring civilizations, especially on Mongolia. The Mongols during the Ming era, they become almost completely um, Lamaized. And in order to um, cement this bond between the different populations on the outside, on the fringes of the Qing, um, the early Qing rulers, namely the, the Manchu state rulers before the conquest, before 1644, they decide that the um, Lamaist, um, the, the Lama tradition, the Lama rites would be elevated to state, to imperial state um, uh, ritual uh, once the con conquest was complete. So this is why Tibet plays such an important role. Here you can see um, dragons, and these dragons are on different colors. These colors adorn the, um, uh, the, um, the banners, literally the, the flags of the eight groups that Nurhaci created. Oh, yeah, Lamaism as the political glue of the Qing. Yes, of course, it's religious as well, but it's the um, Yongzheng Emperor. He was very much wedded to the idea that, um, that every, all the populations be held together by um, certain um, uh, religious practices. And the most important one for the, um, for, for the uh, at least for the aristocratic side, for the um, non-Chinese scholar official side, that would become um, Lamaism. Again, Sangzhuan Fodiao, that's the Chinese term for Lamaism, it's the uh, Tibetan that's Buddhism in the Tibetan tradition. Um, and um, yes, this is from a, a different picture from the Yung uh, He uh, Gung. Uh, and and uh, you, you can here already see very clearly um, <coughs> the, the differences between the, uh, the, the Mongolian and the, the, the Manchu. And now we're at the end of the Qing era. So we, is Manchu still important then? Yes, because people at the court are still being trained in Manchu. So they write um, the documents in Manchu. If you go to the number one archives in, in China, in Beijing, uh, you will find that from this era, you have documents that only exist in Mongolian or in Manchu and not in Chinese languages. Why? Because they wanted to keep the circulation of knowledge to a minimum. So this is the uh, Xianfeng and the Tongzhi emperors um, in the very turbulent period of time for China. Who is really in control? Oh, the Empress Dowager Cixi. Uh, Cixi is from the Yehe tribe, um, which was the only tribe that did not go with Nurhaci in the early 17th century, but sided with the Ming. Therefore, they were punished. The capital of Yehe was completely destroyed. Um, and people from the Yehe had a reputation of being of dubious loyalty to the, to the Qin. Um, but here we have her. And um, uh, so you see, um, she's, uh, she's referred to here as Huang Hou. So this is, the, this is, of course, the Huang Hou. Um, so this is um, the, a, a, a title, which in English is translated as Empress Dowager. But, um, the, the term is very much um, um, a tai ho, that, that would be the um, Empress Dowager, but, but the, the Manchu term actually suggests that this is an empire, yes? Uh, a, a, sorry, it's Empress. Empress. Hmm? Um, she is in control. Does she know Manchu? She knows actually quite a bit. And uh, how do we know? Um, well, we get a lot of negative news about her. Uh, she was a very clever uh, diplomat. She knew how to not just manipulate, but actually she was a power politician. She, she understood um, politics both within the court and uh, uh, with uh, the outside world. So here you have in uh, Tzu Xi's own handwriting, uh, Manchu, Manchu script. So if you enlarge this, um, this is, um, again, you see the you see the spine that I talked about earlier on. Um, in fact, um, 
if anything, she leaves minimal distances between the words, so it looks almost as if it was sewn out of the uh, um, embroidered. <laughs> but um, uh, no, nope. this is it. So this is the. Uh, um, these are uh, very much uh, this pays testimony to the fact that even at the very in the very last years of the um, of the Qing, um, uh, people like Sushi, like uh, Prince Gong, Xin, um, very important uh, character for the uh, uh, reformation of the Qing Empire, but even the last emperor, the boy emperor Fu Yi, um, that they knew how to uh, write and use Manchu. Why, why, why? Because here we have a very interesting little notebook, um, which is Pui's trilingual notebook. Um, it's in English, in because he was learning English with um, uh, uh, Reginald Johnson, a very uh, important person when it comes to uh, East-Western contacts, um, Chinese and Manchu. So, uh, and his Manchu is not bad. So this shows that he had practice. And this practice is something that you will also get when you learn um, Manchu conscientiously. So um, now the concluding slides, they will show you what happened to the Manchus uh, from the end of the 19th century onwards. And um, this was a stroke of bad luck because um, they were being singled out by, you can call them proto-nationalists, if you like, um, such as the Taiping. Um, in their quest to eradicate the Qing as the ruling empire on earth, as they saw it. Um, they particularly uh, directed their hatred against the Manchus, who they saw as not just aliens, but actually evil spirits. They saw them as, uh, as, as, as satanic creatures that needed to be um, extirpated in every sense of the word. So not just driven out of China, but really destroyed. So this was, there was only one way of dealing with them, namely complete destruction or system, systematic destruction. And this happened by attacking the garrison communities that you found uh, all, uh, spread all over the uh, Taiping territory. Um, whenever the, uh, a warrior family lost, uh, a, a Manchu warrior family lost um, a battle, they would be expected Put an end to their own lives. So this is very much a, um, it's quite a gruesome uh, example of military honor that the family members, once the, once the fighting soldiers had been killed, they had to be killed, starting with the youngest ones. And the person who did that was the oldest one, namely the grandmother. The grandmother's job was to kill the entire family. And um, this, was the, uh, this was to preserve the honor, but also to make sure that they, the Manchus would not be singled out for um, the type of pogroms that went on. For example, during the Qianlong, sorry, during, during the Taiping uprising in the mid 18th century, but then also in the aftermath of the rebellion that led to the victory of the nationalists. There were pogroms in certain cities, not, not all of them, and in some cities there were negotiated settlements, but um, the Manchus had to keep their heads down. And what we know from the Republican era, when, uh, so this is Sun Yat-sen on the left, this is uh, Jiang Kai-shek, Kai Sun Yixian, Jiang Yexu, um, they, they made it clear that the first and foremost loyalty would not be to the clan or to the banner or to the Manchu nation, but to the Chinese state. And um, whoever made a point out of having traditions that went beyond that, that included also the, the Muslims and other groups, live dangerously. So um, that's why from this time onwards, um, families such as the um, Shumuro, we have the Shu here, the Shu, 
this character is the Manchu Sumuru. And um, this gives you a, uh, an idea how they tried to uh, integrate into Republican China, namely by seeming as Chinese as possible. Um, you may have heard of Lao Shu. He lived in London for some time, not just that, he worked at SOAS for some time. And he complained about being underpaid because he was Chinese. Um, he complained about racism at, at the workplace. And um, uh, th this was one of the reasons why he ran out of money. Another reason was perhaps also because he lived in a relatively well-to-do part, um, lower end, Notting Hill, Notting Dale, so <laughs> lower end of a very well-to-do area. So maybe he spent a little bit too much money there, so we don't know. Uh, but um, in any case, um, uh, he uh, is a member of the, um, the plain red banner, so one of the eight banners, um, but he never made a point of it. Um, how do we know whether somebody belongs to a Manchu family or not today? Um, looking at the surname, the family name often helps because there are certain names that um, are being transliterated into Chinese. Lao Shu is, of course, a famous writer of the Republican era, of the May 4th era. So here you have a map of the, um, of, uh, the Republic um, published in Taiwan not so long ago. Um, you can see that this Chantu also includes Outer Mongolia, uh, because for the Republic of China, Outer Mongolia is still part of it. So this is the, um, uh, in essence, the inheritance of the, um, of, of the uh, Qing Empire. Uh, not part of it is the Primozhki Krai here, this, this part down to Vladivostok, which um, is which seeded with the help of Zaharov uh, in 1856-78. So this is um, um, very much a, um, of course, an area where the, um, uh, where it goes to show that the, the fate of empires is always uh, limited by uh, wars by diplomacy. But anyway, in this empire, in this, sorry, in this state, which in theory includes all the territory of the Qing, the Manchus were still spread out, completely spread out as they, as they had been. And for many years, it was almost taken for granted that their traditions would die away, that the language would die away. Now, like with Asterix, there's this small little village in, um, uh, oh, on this map, I can't find it. It's the it's on the um, uh, uh, on the e westernmost edge of Xinjiang. You get a former garrison which was left completely on its own, and that is the Shiba, Shiba, uh, which is a um, uh, recognized as a separate nationality today. But actually, the language that they speak is uh, is Manchu, and they they have a larger content of um, Mongolian words, also some Russian words as well, but um, innovations that came in when the, uh, when the, uh, uh, the Eastern Turkestani Xinjiang state was uh, uh, more or less supported by the Soviet Union in the, um, um, in the, in the war years, um, there was also some influence that came from Russia. Uh, but in any case, um, in this period, uh, we can see that oh, from right up to um, the, year 2000, in the early 2010s, you can see that um, uh, the, the, the use of Manchu uh, dwindled in those areas where it used to be strongest, namely Manchuria, but remained relatively strong in Shibua, in the Shibua territories. So what, what, what is happening now in, in China with the, um, uh, with the study of, the, the, of Manchu? It is very much, it is actually not um, limited by any of the um, um, the policies that we find under Xi Jinping today, um, uh, it's, uh, you will find that most people who study Manchu are the descendants of um, Manchu families, Manchu banners themselves. Um, and they always kept up a, the memory, positive memory of having been part of the Manchu. So you find many young people learning Manchu who, are, who want to be, um, want to revive this tradition. So of course here the, the quip is if you, th this is actually a cover from before um, uh, 
uh, uh, Trump came to power. So this is before, <laughs> before the fallout between China and the United States. Um, so, uh, what, what it means to say is that the rulers of the, um, of the um, uh, People's Republic in China, they had a lot in common with the rulers of the Qianlong era, when China, 1793, so when China was at its strongest, and, uh, and it's this parallel that uh, they wanted to, to make, that Xi Jinping during that time was um, uh, the inheritor of a very strong empire. But we also know that the Qin, Qing Empire at that uh, stage was a multi-ethnic, multilingual empire. So this is perhaps where he's going a little bit off the record of the, um, uh, of the, the Qin rulers. But um, learning Manchu today in China is a relatively um, um, popular thing to do um, amongst the, the, the Manchus. The, uh, and um, uh, there are a few centers where uh, mostly, of course, in the Northeast um, and in Beijing, uh, where, where this has been taken seriously. 